Chapter One of Rowdy of the Cross L. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. Rowdy of the Cross L by B. M. Bower. Chapter One Lost in a Blizzard. Rowdy Vaughan, he had been christened Roland by his mother, and rechristened Rowdy by his cowboy friends, who are prone to treat with much irreverence the names bestowed by mothers, was not happy. He stood in the stirrups and shook off the thick layer of snow which clung damp and close-packed to his coat. The dull yellow folds were full of it. His gray hat, pulled low over his purple ears, was heaped with it. He reached up a gloved hand and scraped away as much as he could, wrapped the long-skirted sourdough coat around his numbed legs, then settled into the saddle with a shiver of distaste at the plight he was in, and wished himself back at the horseshoe bar. Dixie, standing knee-deep in a drift, shook himself much after the manner of his master. Perhaps he also wished himself back at the horseshoe bar. He turned his head to look back blinking at the snow which beat insistently in his eyes. He could not hold them open long enough to see anything, however, so he twitched his ears pettishly and gave over the attempt. "'It's up to you, old boy,' Rowdy told him resignedly. "'I'm plumb lost. I never was in this damn country before, anyhow, and I sure wished I wasn't here now. If you got any idea where we're at, I'm dead willing to have you pilot the layout.' Never mind Chubb. Locating his feed when it's stuck under his nose is his limit. Chubb lifted an ear dispiritedly when his name was spoken, but as was usually the case, he heard no good of himself and dropped his head again. No one took heed of him. No one ever did. His part was to carry Vaughn's bed and to follow unquestionably where Vaughn and Dixie might lead. He was cold and tired and hungry, but his faith in his master was strong, the responsibility of finding shelter before the dark came down rested not with him. Vaughn pressed his chilled knees against Dixie's ribs, but the hand upon the reins was carefully non-committal, so that Dixie, having no suggestion of his master's wish, ventured to indulge his own. He turned tail squarely to the storm and went straight ahead. Vaughn put his hands deep in his pockets, snuggled further down into the sheepskin collar of his coat, and rode passive, enduring. They brought up against a wire fence, and Vaughn, rousing from his apathy, tried to peer through the white, shifting wall of the storm. "'You're a swell guide. Not,' he remarked to the horse. "'Now you, you hike down this fence till you locate a gate or a corner, or any darn thing, and I don't give a cuss if the snow does get in your eyes. It's your own fault.' Dixie, sneezing the snow from his nostrils, turned obediently. Chubb, his feet dragging wearily in the snow, trailed patiently behind. Half an hour of this, and it seemed as if it would go on forever. Through the swirl, Vaughn could see the post standing forlornly in the snow, with sixteen feet of blizzard between. At no time could he distinguish more than two or three at once, and there were long minutes when the wall stood blank and shifting, just beyond the first post. Then Dixie lifted his head and gazed questioningly before him. His ears pointed forward, sentient, strained, and whinnied shrill challenge. He hurried his steps, dragging Chubb out of the beginnings of a dream. Vaughn straightened and took his hands from his pockets. Out beyond the dim, wavering outline of the farthest post, came answer to the challenge. A mysterious, vague shape grew impalpably upon the strained vision. A horse sneezed, then nickered eagerly. Vaughn drew up and waited. Hello, he called cheerfully. Pleasant day, this. Out for your health? The shape hesitated, as though taken aback by the greeting, and there was no answer. Vaughn, puzzled, rode closer. Say, don't talk so fast, he yelled. I can't follow you. Who, who is it? The voice sounded perturbed, and it was, moreover, the voice of a woman. Vaughn pulled up short and swore into his collar. 
women are not as a rule to be met out on the blank prairie in a blizzard his voice when he spoke again was not ironical as it had been it was placating i beg your pardon he said i thought it was a man i'm looking for the cross l you don't happen to know where it is do you no i don't she declared dismally i don't know where any place is i'm teaching school in this neighborhood or some other i was going to spend sunday with a friend but this storm came up and i'm lost same here said rowdy pleasantly as though being lost was a matter for congratulation oh i was in hopes so was i so we're even there we'll have to pool our chances i guess any gate down that way or haven't you followed the fence i followed it for miles and miles it seemed it must be some big field of the cross l but they have so very many big fields and you couldn't give a rough guess at how far it is to the cross l insinuatingly he could vaguely see her shake her head ordinarily it should be about six miles beyond rodway's where i board but i haven't the haziest idea of where rodway's place is you see so that won't help you much i'm all at sea in this snow her voice was rueful well if you came up the fence there's no use going back that way and there's sure nothing made by going away from it that's the way i came why not go the way you're headed we might as well i suppose she assented and rowdy turned and rode by her side grateful for the plurality of the pronoun which tacitly included him in her wanderings and meditating many things for one he wondered if she was as nice a girl as her voice sounded he could not see much of her face because it was muffled in a white silk scarf only her eyes showed and they were dark and bright when he awoke to the fact that the wind grown colder beat upon her cruelly he dropped behind a pace and took the windy side that he might shield her with his body but if she observed the action she gave no sign her face was turned from him in the wind and she rode without speaking after long plodding the line of posts turned unexpectedly a right angle and vaughn took a long relieved breath we'll have the wind at our backs now he remarked i guess we may as well keep on and see where this fence goes to his tone was too elaborately cheerful to be cheering he was wondering if the girl was dressed warmly it had been so warm and sunny before the blizzard struck but now the wind searched out the thin places in one's clothing and ran lead in one's bones where it should be simply marrow he fancied that her voice when she spoke gave evidence of actual suffering and the heart of rowdy vaughan was ever soft towards a woman if you're cold he began i'll open up my bed and get out a blanket he held dixie in tentatively oh don't trouble to do that she protested but there was that in her voice which hardened his impulse into fixed resolution i ought to have thought of it before he lamented and swung down stiffly into the snow her eyes followed his movement with a very evident interest while he unbuckled the pack chubb had carried since sunrise and drew out a blanket stand in your stirrup he commanded briskly and i'll wrap you up it's a navajo and the wind will have a time trying to find a thin spot you're thoughtful she snuggled into it thankfully i was cold vaughn tucked it around her with more care than haste he was pretty uncomfortable himself and for that reason he was the more anxious that the girl should be warm it came to him that she was a cute little school ma'am all right he was glad she belonged close around the cross l he also wished he knew her name and so he set about finding it out with much guile how's that he wanted to know when he had made sure that her feet such tiny feet were well covered he thought it lucky that she did not ride astride after the manner of the latter-day young woman because then he could not have covered her so completely hold on that windy side's going to make trouble he unbuckled the strap he wore to hold his own coat snug about him and put it around the girl's slim waist 
feeling idiotically happy and guilty the while. It don't come within a mile of you, he complained, but it'll help some. Sheltered in the thick folds of the Navajo, she laughed, and the sound of it sent the blood galloping through Rowdy Vaughn's body so that he was almost warm. He went and scraped the snow out of his saddle and swung up, feeling that, after all, there are worse things in the world than being lost and hungry in a blizzard with a sweet-voiced, bright-eyed little school mom who can laugh like that. I don't want to have you think I may be a bold, bad robber man, he said, when they got going again. My name's Rowdy Vaughn, for which I beg your pardon. Mother named me Roland, never knowing I'd get out here and have her nice pretty name mutilated that way. I won't say my behavior never suggested the change, though. I'm from the horseshoe bar, over the line, and if I have my way... I'll be a cross L man before another day. Then he waited expectantly. For fear you may think I'm a robber woman, she answered him solemnly. He felt sure her eyes twinkled, if only he could have seen them. I'm Jessie Conroy, and if you are from over the line, maybe you know my brother Harry. He was over there a year or two. Rowdy hunched his shoulders, presumably at the wind. Harry Conroy's sister, was she? And he swore. I may have met him, he parried, in a tone you'd never notice as being painstakingly careless. I think I did come to think of it. Miss Conroy seemed displeased, and presently the cause was forthcoming. If you'd ever met him, she said, you'd hardly forget him. Rowdy mentally agreed profanely. He's the best writer in the whole country, and the handsomest. He, he's splendid, and he's the only brother I've got. It's a pity you never got acquainted with him. Yes, lied Rowdy, and thought a good deal in a very short time. Harry Conroy's sister. Well, she wasn't to blame for that, of course, nor for thinking her brother a white man. I remember I did see him ride once, he observed. He was a whirlwind, all right. And he sure was handsome, too. Miss Conroy turned her face toward him and smiled her pleasure, and Rowdy hovered between heaven and another place. He was glad she smiled, and he was afraid of what that subject might discover for his straightforward tongue in the way of pitfalls. It would not be nice to let her know what he really thought of her brother. This looks to me like a lane, he said diplomatically. We must be getting somewhere. Don't you recognize any landmarks? Miss Conroy leaned forward and peered through the clouds of snow dust. Already the night was creeping down upon the land, stealthily turning the blank white of the blizzard into a blank gray, which was as near darkness as it could get because of the snow which fell and fell and yet seemed never to find an abiding place, but danced and swirled giddily in the wind as the cold froze it dry. There would be no more damp, clinging masses that night. It was sifting down like flour from a giant sieve, and of the supply there seemed no end. I don't know of any lanes around here, she began dubiously, unless it's... Vaughn looked sharply at her muffled figure and wondered why she broke off so suddenly. She was staring hard at the few faint traces of landmarks, and bundled in the red and yellow Navajo blanket with her bright, dark eyes, she might easily have passed for a slim young squaw. Out ahead, a dog began barking vaguely, and Rowdy turned eagerly to the sound. Dixie, scenting human habitation, stepped out more briskly through the snow, and even Chubb lifted an ear briefly to show he heard. It may not be anyone you know, Vaughn remarked, and his voice showed his longing. But it'll be shelter and a warm fire and supper. Can you appreciate such blessings, Miss Conroy? I can. I've been in the saddle since sunrise, and I was so sure I'd strike the cross L by dinner time that I didn't bring a bite to eat. It was a sheep camp where I stopped, and the grub didn't look good to me anyway. I've called myself bad names all the afternoon for being more dainty than sensible. 
But it's all right now, I guess. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Rowdy of the Cross L by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter two. Miss Conroy refuses shelter. The storm lifted suddenly, as storms have a way of doing, and a low, squat ranch house stood dimly revealed against the bleak expanse of wind-tortured prairie. Rowdy gave an exultant little whoop and made for the gate, leaned and swung it open and rode through, dragging Chubb after him by main strength, as usual. When he turned to close the gate after Miss Conroy, he found her standing still in the lane. "'Come on in!' he called, with a trace of impatience, born of his weariness and hunger. "'Thank you, no,' Miss Conroy's voice was as crisply cold as the wind which fluttered the Navajo blanket around her face. "'I much prefer the blizzard.' For a moment, Rowdy found nothing to say. He just stared. Miss Conroy shifted uneasily in the saddle. "'This is old Bill Brown's place,' she explained reluctantly. He, I'd rather freeze than go in. Well, I guess that won't be hard to do, he retorted curtly, if you stay out much longer. The dog was growing hysterical over their presence, and Bill Brown himself came out to see what it was all about. He could see two dim figures at the gate. Hello, he shouted. Why don't you come on in? What are you standing there chewing the rag for? Vaughn hesitated, his eyes upon Miss Conroy. "'Go in,' she commanded imperiously, quite as if he were a refractory pupil. "'You're tired out and hungry. I'm neither. Besides, I know where I am now. I can find my way without any trouble. Go in, I tell you.' But Rowdy stayed where he was, with the gate creaking to and fro between them. Dixie circled till his back was to the wind. "'I hope you don't think you're going to mill around out here alone,' Rowdy said tartly. "'I can manage very well. I'm not lost now, I tell you. Broadway's is only three miles from here, and I know the direction.' Bill Brown waded out to them, wondering what weighty discussion was keeping them there in the cold. Vaughn he passed by with the cursory glance of a disinterested stranger, and went on to where Miss Conroy waited stubbornly in the lane. "'Oh, it's you,' he said grimly. "'Well, come in and thaw out. "'I hope you didn't think you wouldn't be welcome. "'You knew better. "'You got lost, I reckon. "'Come on.' "'Miss Conroy struck Badger sharply across the flank "'and disappeared into the night. "'When I ask shelter of you,' she flung back, "'you'll know it.' "'Rowdy started after and met Bill Brown squarely in the gate. "'Bill eyed him sharply.' "'Say, young fella, how'd you come by that pack-horse?' he demanded, as Chubb brushed past him. "'None of your damn business,' snapped Rowdy, and drove the spurs into Dixie's ribs. But Chubb was a handicap at any time. Now, when he was tired, there was no getting anything like speed out of him. He clung to a shuffling trot, which was really no better than a walk." After five minutes spent alternately in spurring Dixie and yanking at Chubb's lead rope, Rowdy grew frightened and took to shouting. While they were in the lane, Miss Conroy must perforce ride straight ahead. But the lane would not last always. As though with malicious intent, the snow swooped down again, and the world became an unreal nightmare world, wherein was nothing save shifting, blinding snow flurry and wind and bitter numbing cold rowdy stood in his stirrups cupped his chilled fingers around his numbed lips and sent a long drawn whoo-wee shrilling weirdly into the night it seemed to him after long listening that from the right came faint reply and he turned and rode recklessly swearing at chubb for his slowness he called again, and the answer, though faint, was unmistakable. He settled heavily into the saddle, too weak from sheer relief to call again. He had not known until then just how frightened he had been, and he was somewhat disconcerted at the discovery. 
in a minute the reaction passed and he shouted a loud hello hello came the voice of miss conroy tantalizingly calm and as superior as the greeting of central were you looking for me mr vaughan she was close to him so close that she had not needed to raise her voice perceptibly rowdy rode up alongside remembering uncomfortably his prolonged shouting i sure was he admitted and then you rode off with my blanket on he was very proud of his matter-of-fact tone oh miss conroy was almost deceived and a bit disappointed i'll give it to you now and you can go back if you know the way no hurry said rowdy politely i'll go on and see if you can find a place that looks good to you you seem pretty particular miss conroy may have blushed in the shelter of the blanket i suppose it did look strange to you she confessed but defiantly bill brown is an enemy to harry he because he lost a horse or two out of a field one time he he actually accused harry of taking them he lied of course and nobody believed him nobody could believe a thing like that about harry it was perfectly absurd but he did his best to hurt harry's name and i would rather freeze than ask shelter of him wouldn't you in my place i mean i always stand up for my friends evaded rowdy and if i had a brother of course you'd be loyal approved miss conroy warmly but i didn't want you to come on it isn't your quarrel and i know the way now you needn't have come any farther you forgot the blanket rowdy reminded wickedly i think a lot of that navajo you insisted upon my taking it she retorted and took refuge in silence for a long hour they plodded blindly rowdy beat his hands often about his body to start the blood and meditated yearningly upon his hot coffee and the things he liked best to eat also a good long pull at a flask wouldn't be bad either he thought and he hoped this little school mom knew where she was going truth to tell he doubted it after a while it seemed that miss conroy doubted it also she took to leaning forward and straining her eyes to see through the gray wall before there should be a gate here she said dubiously at last it seems to me rowdy ventured mildly if there were a gate it would have some kind of fence hitched to it wouldn't it miss conroy was in no mood for facetiousness and refused to answer his question i surely can't have made a mistake she observed uneasily it'd be a wonder if you didn't such a night as this he consoled i wouldn't bank on traveling straight myself even if i knew the country which i don't and i've been in more blizzards than i'm years old rodway's place can't be far away she said brightening it may be further to the east shall we try that way if you know which is east sure we'll try it's all we can do my pack horse is about all in from the way he hangs back if we don't strike something pretty soon i'll have to turn him loose oh don't do that she begged it would be too cruel we're sure to reach rodway's very soon more plodding through drifts high and drifts low more leaning from saddles to search anxiously for trace of something besides snow and wind and biting cold then far to the right a yellow eye glowed briefly when the storm paused to take breath miss conroy gave a glad little cry and turned badger sharply did you see it was the light from a window we were going the wrong way i'm sure that's rodway's rowdy thanked the lord and followed her they came up against a fence found a gate and passed through while they hurried toward it the light winked welcome as they drew near someone stirred the fire and sent sparks and rose-hued smoke rushing up into the smother of snow rowdy watched them wistfully and wondered if there would be supper and strong hot coffee he lifted miss conroy out of the saddle carried her two long strides and deposited her upon the doorstep rapped imperatively and when a voice replied lifted the latch and pushed her in before him for a moment they stood blinking just within the door the change from numbing cold and darkness 
to the light of the overheated room was stupefying then miss conroy went over and held her little gloved hands to the heat of the stove but she did not take the chair which someone pushed toward her she stood the blanket shrouding her face and her slim young figure and looked about her curiously it was not rodway's house after all she thought she knew what place it was the shack where rodway's hay balers batched from the first rowdy did not like the look of things though for himself it did not matter he was used to such scenes it was the presence of the girl which made him uncomfortable he unbuttoned his coat that the warmth might reach his chilled body and frowned four men sat around a small dirty table evidently the arrivals had interrupted an exciting game of seven-up a glance told rowdy even if his nose had not that the four round ribbed bottles had not been nearly emptied without effect i one on the house the man nearest him cried and shoved the bottle towards him involuntarily rowdy reached for it now that he was inside he realized all at once how weary he was and cold and hungry each abused muscle and nerve seemed to have a distinct grievance against him his fingers closed around the bottle before he remembered and dropped it he looked up hoping miss conroy had not observed the action met her wide questioning eyes and the blood flew guiltily to his cheeks thanks boys not any for me he said and apologized to miss conroy with his eyes the man rose and confronted him unsteadily that's a hell of a way you too proud to drink with us you drink now my gar i'll make you drink rowdy's eyelids drooped which was a bad sign for those who knew him you're forgetting there's a lady present he reminded warningly the man turned a brief contemptuous glance towards the stove you got that damn queer way to talk i don't call no squaw no lady you drink quick now Ah, oh, shut up frenchy the man at his elbow abjured him he don't have to drink if he don't want to you keep the face close the other retorted majestically and cursed loud and long and incoherently rowdy drew back his arm with a fist that meant trouble for somebody but there were others before him who pinned the importunate host to the table where he squirmed unavailingly rowdy buttoned up his coat the while he eyed the group disgustedly i guess we'll drift he remarked you don't look good to me and that's no dream aw stay and warm up the fourth man expostulated you don't need to mind lefebvre he's drunk but rowdy opened the door decisively and miss conroy her cheeks like two storm-buffeted poppies followed him out with dignity albeit trailing a yard of red and yellow navajo blanket behind her rowdy lifted her into the saddle tucked her feet carefully under the blanket and said never a word mr vaughn she began hesitatingly this is too bad you need not have left i i wasn't afraid i knew you weren't conceded rowdy but it was a hard formation for a woman are there any more places on this flat marked unavailable miss conroy replied misanthropically that if there were they would be sure to find them they took up their weary wanderings again while the yellow eye of the window winked after them they missed rodway's by a scant hundred yards and didn't know it because the side of the house next to them had no lighted windows they traveled in a wide half circle and thought they were leaving a straight trail behind them more than once rowdy was urged by his aching arm to drop the lead rope and leave chub to shift by himself but habit was strong and his heart was soft then he felt an odd twitching at the lead rope as if chub were minded to rebel against their leadership rowdy yanked him into remembrance of his duty and wondered bill brown's question came insistently to mind he wondered the more two minutes and the lead rope was sawing against the small of his back again rowdy turned dixie's head and spoke for the first time in an hour my pack horse seems to have an idea about where he wants to go he said i guess we might as well follow him as anybody he ain't often taken with a rush of brains to the head and we can't be any worse lost than we are now can we miss conroy said no dispiritedly 
and they swung about and followed Chubb's leadership apathetically. It took Chubb just five minutes to demonstrate that he knew what he was about. When he stopped, it was with his nose against a corral gate. Not content with that, he whinnied, and a new exultant note was in the sound. A deep-voiced dog bayed loudly, and a shrill yelp cut in and clamored for recognition. Miss Conroy gasped. "'It's Lion and Skeesix! We're at Rodway's, Mr. Vaughn!' Rowdy, for the second time, thanked the Lord. But when he was stripping the pack off Chubb's back ten minutes later, he was thinking many things he would not have cared to say out loud. It might be all right, but it sure was strange, he told himself, that Chubb belonged here at Rodway's when Harry Conroy claimed he was an Oregon horse. Rowdy had thought his account against Harry Conroy long enough, but it looked now as though another item must be added to the list. He went in and ate his supper thoughtfully, and when he got into bed, he did not fall asleep within two minutes, as he might be expected to do. His last conscious thought was not of stolen horses, however. It was, and she's Harry Conroy's sister. Now, what do you think of that? But all the same, she's sure a nice little school mom. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Rowdy of the Cross L by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Three Rowdy Hires a New Boss. Next morning after breakfast, Mr. Rodway followed Vaughn out to the stable and repeated Bill Brown's question. I'd like to know where you got this horse, he began, with an apologetic sort of determination in his tone. He happens to belong to me. He was run off with a bunch three years ago, and this is the first trace anyone has got of em. I see the brand's been worked. It was a Roman four. That's my brand. Now it looks like a map of Texas. But I'd swear to the horse. Raised him from a colt. Rowdy had expected something of the sort, and he knew quite well what he was going to do. He had settled that the night before with the memory of Miss Conroy's eyes fresh in his mind. "'I got him in a deal across the line,' he said. "'I was told he came from East Oregon, but last night, when he piloted us straight to your corral gate, I guessed he'd been here before. He's yours all right, if you say so.' "'Of course, he ain't worth such a pile of money,' apologized Rodway. "'But the kids thought a heap of him.' I'd rather locate some of the horses that was with him, or the man you got him of. There were some mighty good horses run out of this country then, but they was all out on that range, so we didn't miss em in time to do any good. Do you know who took em across the line? No, said Rowdy deliberately. The man I got Chubb from went north, and I heard he got killed. I don't know of any other in the deal. Rodway grunted and Vaughn began vigorously brushing Dixie's roughened coat. "'If you don't mind,' he said after a minute, "'I'd like to borrow Chubb to pack my bed over to the Cross L. I can bring him back again.' "'Why, sure,' assented Rodway eagerly. "'I hate to take him from you, but the kids—' "'Oh, that's all right,' interrupted Rowdy cheerfully. "'It's all in the game, and I should have looked up his pedigree, for I knew—' anyway was worth the price of him to have him along last night we'd a milled around till daylight i guess only for him that's what agreed rodway jessie's horse is one she brought from home lately and he ain't located yet i don't know as he'd a piloted her home billy that's what the kids named him was born and raised here you see i'll bet he's glad to get back and the kids'll be plumb wild Rowdy did not answer. There seemed nothing in particular to say, and he was wondering if he would see Miss Conroy before he left. She had not eaten breakfast with the others. From their manner, he judged that no one expected her to. He was not well informed upon the subject of school moms, but he had a hazy impression that late rising was a distinguishing characteristic, and he did not know how late. He saddled leisurely and packed his bed for the last time upon Chubb. 
the red and yellow navajo blanket he folded tenderly with an unconscious smile for the service it had done and laid it in its accustomed place in the bed then having no plausible excuse for going back to the house he mounted and rode away into the brilliant white world watching wistfully the house from the tail of his eye she might have got up in time to see him off he thought discontentedly but he supposed one cowpuncher more or less made little difference to her anyway he didn't know as he had any license to moon around her she probably had a fellow she might even be engaged for all he knew and she was harry conroy's sister and from his experience with the breed good looks didn't count for anything harry was good-looking and he was a snake if ever there was one he had never expected to lie for him but he had done it all right and because harry's sister happened to have nice eyes and a pretty little foot he had half a mind to go back and tell rodway all he knew about those horses it was only a matter of time anyway till harry conroy overshot the mark and got what was coming to him he sure didn't owe harry anything that he had need to shield him like he had done still rodway would wonder why he hadn't told it at first and that little girl believed in harry and said he was splendid huh he wondered if she really meant that if she did he squared his back to the house and the memory of miss conroy's eyes and plodded across the field to the gate now the sun was shining and there was no possibility of getting lost the way to the cross l lay straight and plain before him rowdy rode leisurely up over the crest of a ridge beyond which lay the home ranch of the cross l whether it was henceforth to be his home he had yet to discover though there was reason for hoping that it would be even so venturesome a man as rowdy vaughan would scarce ride a long hundred miles through unpeopled prairie in the tricky month of march without some reason for expecting a welcome at the end of his journey in this case a previous acquaintance with wooden shoes milky foreman of the cross l was rowdy's trump card wooden shoes whenever chance had brought them together in the last two or three years was ever urging rowdy to come over and unroll his sugans in the cross l bed tent and promising the best string in the outfit to ride besides other things alluring to a cowpuncher so that when his relations with the horseshoe bar became strained rowdy remembered his friend at the cross l and the promises and ed drifted south just now he hoped that wooden shoes would be home to greet him and his eyes searched wishfully the huddle of low-eaved cabins and the assortment of sheds and corrals for the bulky form of the foreman but no one seemed to be about except a big-bodied bandy-legged individual who appeared to be playfully chasing a big bright bay stallion inside the large enclosure where stood the cabins rowdy watched them impersonally a glance proved that the man was not wooden shoes and so he was not particularly interested in him or his doings it did occur to him however that if the fellow wanted to catch that brute he ought to have sense enough to get a horse no one but a plumb idiot would mill around in that snow afoot he jogged down the slope at a shuffling trot grinning tolerantly at the pantomime below he of the bandy legs stopped evidently out of breath the stallion stopped also snorting defiance rowdy heard him plainly even at that distance the horse arched his neck and watched the man warily ready to be off at the first symptom of hostilities and rowdy observed that a short rope hung from his halter swaying as he moved bandy legs seemed to have an idea he turned and scuttled to the nearest cabin returning with what seemed a basin of oats for he shook it enticingly and edged cautiously toward the horse rowdy could imagine him coaxing with hypocritically endearing names such as good old boy and steady now billy or whatever the horse's name might be rowdy chuckled to himself and hoped the horse saw through the subterfuge perhaps the horse chuckled also at any rate he stood quite still equally prepared to bounce away on the instant or to don the mask of docility bandy legs drew nearer and nearer shaking the basin briskly like an old woman sifting meal the horse waited 
his nostrils quivering hungrily at the smell of the oats and with an occasional low nicker mandy legs went on tiptoes or as near as he could in the snow the basin at arm's length before the dainty flaring nostrils sniffed tentatively dipped into the basin and snuffed the oats about luxuriously till he felt a stealthy hand seize the dangling rope at the touch he snorted protest and was off and away upsetting bandy legs and the basin ignominiously into a high piled drift bandy legs sat up scraped the snow out of his collar and his ears and swore it was then that rowdy appeared like an angel of deliverance won't that horse caught he yelled cheerfully bandy legs lifted up his voice and bellowed things i should not like to repeat verbatim but rowdy gathered that the man emphatically did want that so-and-so and then some horse caught and that it couldn't be done a blessed minute too soon whereat rowdy smiled anew with his face discreetly turned away from bandy legs and took down his rope and widened the loop also he turned chub loose the stallion evidently sensed what new danger threatened his stolen freedom and circled the yard with high springy strides rowdy circled after saw his chance swirled the loop twice over his head and hazarded a long throw rowdy knew it for pure good luck that it landed right but to this day bandy legs looks upon him as a wonder with a rope and bandy legs would insist upon the capital where shall i take em rowdy asked coming up with his captive and with nothing but his eyes to show how he was laughing inwardly bandy legs crawled from the drift still scraping snow from inside his collar and gave many directions about going through a certain gate into such and such a corral from there into a stable and by seeming devious ways into a minutely described stall all right said rowdy cutting short the last needless details i guess i can find the trail and started off leading the stallion bandy legs followed and chubb observing the departure of dixie ambled faithfully in the rear much obliged conceded bandy legs when the stallion was safely housed and tied securely where are you headed for young man right here rowdy told him calmly loosening dixie's cinch i'm the long lost top hand that the cross l's been watching the skyline for lo these many moons a yearning for the privilege of handing me forty plunks about twice as fast as i've got em coming where's the boss uh, i'm him confessed bandy legs meekly and circled the two dubiously i guess you've heard of eagle creek smith i'm him a cross l belongs to me rowdy let out an explosive and showed a row of nice teeth well i ain't hard to please he added i won't kick on that i guess i like your looks toliber well and i'm willing to take you on for a boss if you do your part i bet we'll get along fine his tone was banteringly patronizing anyway i'll try you for a spell you can put my name down as rowdy vaughn lately kinned from the horseshoe bar what for ventured bandy legs rather eagle creek still circling rowdy dubiously what for was i kinned repeated rowdy easily being a modest youth i hate to tell you but the old man's son and me we disagreed and one of his eyes swelled some so did mine a little he stood head and shoulders above eagle creek and he smiled down upon him engagingly eagle creek capitulated before the smile well i ain't got any sons that i know of he grinned so i guess you can consider yourself a cross l man till further notice why sure the teeth gleamed again briefly that's what i've been telling you right along where's old wooden shoes he's responsible for me being here gone to chinook he'll be back in a day or two eagle creek shifted his feet awkwardly say he glanced uneasily behind him you don't want to let it get around that you sort of hired me see of course not rowdy assured him i was only joshin 
If you don't want me, just tell me to hit the sod. You stay right where you're at, commanded Eagle Creek with returned confidence in himself and his authority. Of a truth, this self-assured, straight-limbed young man had rather dazed him. Take your bed and war bag up to the bunkhouse and make yourself tome till the boys get back. And say, where'd you get that pack horse? The laugh went out of Rowdy's tawny eyes. The question hit a spot that was becoming sore. I borrowed him this morning from Mr. Rodway, he said evenly. I'm to take him back today. I stopped there last night. Oh, Eagle Creek coughed apologetically and said no word, while Rowdy led Chubb back to the cabin, which he had pointed out as the bunkhouse. He stood by while Rowdy loosened the pack and dragged it inside. I guess you can get located here, he said. I ain't working more than three or four men just now, but there's quite a few of the boys stopping here. Crossell's a regular hangout for cowpunchers. You're a little early for the season, but I'll see you have something to do. Just to keep you out of devilment. Rowdy's brows unbent. It would seem that Eagle Creek was capable of joshing also. It's up to you, old-timer, he retorted. I'm strong and willing and don't shy at anything but pitchforks. Eagle Creek grinned. This ain't no blame cow hospital, he gave as a parting shot. All the hay that's shovel on this ranch needn't hurt nobody's feelings. With that, he shut the door and left Rowdy to acquaint himself with his new home. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Rowdy of the Cross L by B. M. Bauer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn Chapter 4 Pink as Chaperone Rowdy was sprawled ungracefully upon somebody's bunk. He neither knew nor cared whose. And he was snoring unmelodiously, and not dreaming a thing. For, when a cowpuncher has nothing in particular to do, he sleeps to atone for the weary hours when he must be very wide awake. An avalanche descended upon his unwarned middle and checked the rhythmic ebb and flow of sound. He squawked, and came to life clawing viciously i'd like to know where the devil you come from a voice remarked plaintively in a soft treble rowdy opened his eyes with a snap pink by all that's good and bad get up off my diaphragm you little fiend pink absent-mindedly kneaded rowdy's stomach with his knuckles and immediately found himself in a far corner he came back dimpling mischievously he looked much more an angel than a fiend, for all his angora chaps and flame-colored scarf. Your bed and war bag's on my bunk. You're on Smokey's, and Dixie's making himself to home in the corral. By all them signs and tokens, I'd give a reckless guess you're here to stay a while. That right? He prodded again at Rowdy's ribs. It sure is, Pink. And if I'd known you was holding out here... I'd a come sooner, maybe. You sure look good to me, you darn little cuss. Rowdy sat up and took a lightning inventory of the four or five other fellows lounging about. He must have slept pretty sound, he thought, not to hear them come in. Pink read the look and bethought him of the necessary introductions. This is my sidekicker over the line that you've heard about till you're plumb weary, boys, he announced musically. His name is Rowdy Vaughn, Bronco Peeler, Crap Fiend, an all-round bad man. He ain't a safe companion, and you want to sleep with your six-gun cuddled under your right ear, and never on no account show him your backs. He's a real wolf, he is, and the only reason I live to tell the tale is because he respects my size. Boys... I'm afraid for you, but I wish you well. Pink, you need killin', and I'm tempted to live up to my rep, grinned Rowdy indulgently. Read me the pedigree of your friends. Oh, they ain't no worse when you get used to em. 
that long-legged jasper with the far away look in his eyes is the silent one if he takes a notion to you he'll maybe tell you the name his mother calls him he may have seen better days but here's hopin he won't see no worse he once was a tenderfoot but he's convalescing the silent one nodded carelessly but with a quick measuring glance that rowdy liked this unshaved savage is smoky he's harmless if you don't mention socialism in his presence and if you do he'll down with the trust and long live the sons of toil all hours of the night and keep folks awake then him and the fellow that started him off will likely get chap good and plenty oh there's jim ellis and bob nevin they both turned a cow or two and i've seen worse specimens running around loose plenty of em that man hiding behind a grin you can see him if you look close is sunny sam you needn't take no notice of him unless you're a mind to he won't care he's dead gentle say he broke off how do you happen to stray on to this range anyhow you used to belong to the horseshoe bar so solid the assessor always took you down to the personal property list they won't pay taxes on me no more son rowdy's eyes dwelt fondly upon pink's cupid bow mouth and dimples he had never dreamed of finding pink here though when he came to think of it there was no reason why he shouldn't pink was not like any one else he was slight and girlish to look at but you mustn't trust appearances for pink was all muscles strung on steel wire according to the belief of those who tried to handle him he had little white hands and feet that looked quite comfortable in a number four boot and his hair was a tawny gold and curled in distracting damp rings on his forehead his eyes were blue and long-lashed and beautiful and they looked at the world with baby innocence whereas a more sophisticated little devil never jangled spurs at his heels he was everything but insipid and men liked him unless he chose to dislike them when they thought of him with grating teeth to find him bullying the cross l boys brought a warmth to rowdy's heart pink made a cigarette and then offered rowdy his tobacco sack and asked questions about the cypress hills country how was this girl and was that one married yet and did the other still grieve for him as a matter of fact he had yet to see the girl who could quicken his pulse a single beat and for that reason it sometimes pleased him to affect susceptibility beyond that of other men it was after dinner when he and rowdy went humming down to the stables gossiping like a couple of old women over a back fence i see you got conroy's chub yet pink observed carelessly oh for heaven's sake let up on that cayuse rowdy cried petulantly i wish i'd never got sight of the little buzzard head i've had him crammed down my throat the last day or two till it's getting plumb monotonous pink that cayuse never saw oregon he was raised right on this flat and he belongs to old rodway i got to lead him back there and turn him over to-day pink took three puffs at his cigarette and lifted his long lashes to rowdy's gloom-filled face stole he asked briefly stole rowdy repeated disgustedly so was the whole blame bunch as near as i can make out we might a knowed it we might a guessed harry conroy wouldn't have a straight title to anything if if he could make it crooked i bet he never finished paying back the money you lent him out of the kindness of your heart did he pink leaned against the corral fence then kicked meditatively at a snow-covered rock he did not my son chub's all i ever got out of that deal and i haven't even got him i borrowed him from rodway to pack my bed over borrowed the blame little runny cayuse that cost me sixty-four hard-earned dollars that's what harry borrowed of me and every blame gazebo on the flat wanted to know what i was doing with him i can tell you where to find conroy rowdy he's working for an outfit down on the river i'd sure fix him for this you got plenty of evidence you can send him up like a charm it was different when he cut your latigo strap in that rough riding contest you couldn't prove it on him but this 
Why, man, it's a cinch. I am lost, Harry Conroy, so I ain't looking for him just now, growled Rowdy. As long as he keeps out of reach, I won't ask no more of him. And Pink, I wish you'd keep this quiet about him having Chubb. I told Rodway I couldn't put him next to that fellow that brought that bunch across the line. I told him the fellow went north and got killed. He did go north, fifty miles or so, and he ought to have been killed if he wasn't. Let it go that way, Pink. Pink looked like a cherub-faced child when he's been told there's no Santa Claus. Sure, if you say so, he stammered dubiously. He eyed Rowdy reproachfully and then looked away to the horizon. He kicked the rock out of place, and then poked it painstakingly back with his toe, and from the look of him, he did not know there was a rock there at all. How'd you happen to run across Rodway? he asked guilelessly. I stopped there last night. I got to milling around in that storm, and ran across the school mom that boards at Rodway's. She was plumb lost, too. So we dubbed around together for a while and finally got inside Rodway's field. Then Chubb come alive and piloted us to the house. This morning Rodway claimed him, says the brand has been worked from a Roman four. Oh, it's all straight goods, he added hastily. Old Eagle Creek here knew him too. But Pink was not thinking of Chubb. He hunched his chap belt higher and spat viciously into the snow. I knowed it he declared with melancholy triumph. It's school my Midas that's gave you a softening of the vitals and not no Christian charity play. How come you took that way all unbeknownst to your friends? You never used to bother about no female girls. It's a cinch you're wise that she's Harry's sister and I'd admit she's a swell looker. But so's he, and I should think, Rowdy, you'd had about enough of that brand of snake. There's nothing so snaky about her that I could see, defended Rowdy. He did not particularly relish having his own mental argument against Miss Conroy thrown back at him from another. She seemed to be all right, and if you seen how plucky she was in that blizzard, well, I never heard anybody stand up and call Harry white-livered when you come to that, Pink cut in tartly. Anyway, you're a blame fool. If she was a little white-winged angel, you wouldn't stand no kind of show. And i tell you why. She's got a little tin god that she says prayers to regular. That's Harry. And wouldn't he be the fine brother-in-law? He could borrow all your wages offen you, and when you went to make a pretty ride, he'd up and cut your lad go and give you a fall. And he could work stolen horses off on to you. And you wouldn't give a damn, cause Jessie wears a number two shoe. You must have done some rimrock riding after her yourself, jeered Rowdy, and has got shiny brown eyes just like Harry's. They're not, laughed Rowdy half angrily. If you say that again, Pink, I'll stick your head in a snowbank. Her eyes are all right. They sure look good to me. You sure got em mourned Pink. You need to be close-herded by your friends, and that's no dream. You wait till toward evening before you take that horse back. I'm going along to chaperone you, Rowdy. You ain't safe running loose any more. Rowdy cursed him companionably, and told him to go along if he wanted to, and to look out he didn't throw up his own hands. And Pink grumbled and swore and did go along. But when they got there, Miss Conroy greeted him like a very good friend, which sent Rowdy sulky, and kept him so all the evening. It seemed to him that Pink was playing a double game, and when they started home, he told him so. But Pink turned in his saddle and smiled so that his dimples showed plainly in the moonlight. Chaperones that sit in a corner and look wise are the rankest kind of fakes, he explained. When she was talking to me, she was letting you alone, see? Rowdy accepted the explanation silently and stored it away in his memory. After that, by writing craftily and by threats and by much vituperation, he managed to reach Rodway's unchaperoned at least three times out of five, which was doing remarkably well when one considers pink. 
End of chapter 4「Rowdy of the Cross L » by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 5. At Home at Cross L. In two days Rowdy was quite at home with the Cross L. In a month he found himself transplanted from the smoke-laden air of the bunkhouse and set off from the world in a line camp with nothing to do but patrol the boggy banks of milk river where it was still unfenced and unclaimed by small farmers the only mitigation of his exile so far as he could see lay in the fact that he had pink and the silent one for companions it developed that when he would speak to the silent one he must say jim or wait long for a reply also the silent one was not always silent and he was quick to observe the weak points in those around him and keen at repartee when it pleased him so to do he could handle the english language in a way that was perfectly amazing and not always intelligible to the unschooled at such times pink frankly made no attempt to understand him rowdy having been hustled through grammar school and two-thirds through high school before he ran away from a brand-new stepmother rather enjoyed the outbreaks in pink's consequent disgust not one of them loved particularly the line camp and rowdy least of all since it put an extra ten miles between miss conroy and himself rowdy had got to that point where his mind dwelt much upon matters domestic and he made many secret calculations on the cost of housekeeping for two more than that he put himself upon a rigid allowance for pocket money an allowance barely sufficient to keep him in tobacco and papers all this without consulting miss conroy's wishes which only goes to show that rowdy vaughan was a born optimist the silent one complained that he could not keep supplied with reading matter and pink bewailed the monotony of inaction for beyond watching the river to keep the cattle from miring in the mud lately released from frost grip there was nothing to do according to the calendar spring was well upon them and the prairies would soon be flaunting new dresses of green the calendar however had neglected to record the rainless heat of the summer gone before or the searing winds that burned the grass brown as it grew or the winter which forgot its part and permitted prairie dogs to chip 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 above ground in january when they should be sleeping decently in their cellar homes apart from the brief storm which rowdy had brought with him there had been no snow worth considering always the chill wind shaved the barren land from the north or veered unexpectedly and blew dry warmth from the southwest but never the snow for which the land yearned wind and bright sunlight and more wind and hypocritical drifting clouds and more sun lean cattle walking walking uphill and down coulee nose to the dry ground snipping the stray tufts where should be a woolly carpet of swell ripened grasses eating wild rose bushes level with the sod and wishing there was only an abundance even of them drifting uneasily from hilltop to further hilltop hunger-driven and gaunt where should be sleek content when they sought to continue their quest beyond the river and the weaker bogged at its muddy edge rowdy and pink and the silent one would ride out and with their ropes drag them back ignominiously to solid ground and the very doubtful joy of living mayday found the grassland brown and lifeless with a chill wind blowing over it the cattle wandered as before except that knock-kneed little calves trailed beside their lean mothers and clamored for full stomachs the cross l cattle bore the brunt of the range famine because eagle creek smith was a stockman of the old school his cattle must live on the open range because they always had done so other men bought or leased large tracts of grassland and fenced them for just such an emergency but not he it is true that he had two or three large fields as miss conroy had told rowdy but it was his boast that all the hay he raised was eaten by his saddle horses and that all the fields he owned were used solely for horse pastures the open range was the place for cattle and no cross l critter ever fed inside a wire fence 
through the dry summer before when other men read the ominous signs and hurriedly leased pasture land and cut down their herds to what the fields would feed eagle creek went calmly on as he had done always he shipped what beef was fit and that of a truth was not much and settled down for the winter trusting to winter's snows and spring rains to refill the long dry lakes and water holes and coat the levels anew with grass but the winter snows had failed to appear and with the spring came no rain april showers became a hideously ironical joke at nature's expense always the wind blew and sometimes great flocks of clouds would drift superciliously up from the far skyline play with men's hopes and sail disdainfully on to some more favored land it is all very well for a man to cling stubbornly to precedent but if he clings long enough there comes a time when to cling becomes akin to crime eagle creek smith still stubbornly held that range cattle should be kept to the range he waited until may was fast merging to june watching from sheer habit for the spring transformation of brown prairies into green when it did not come and only the coolie sides and bottoms showed green among the brown he accepted ruefully the unusual conditions which nature had thrust upon him and started wooden shoes out with the wagons on the horse roundup which is a preliminary to the roundup proper as every one knows End of chapter 5chapter six of rowdy of the cross l by b m bower this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom penn chapter six a shot from the dark i call that a bad job well done pink remarked after a long silence as he gave over trying to catch a fish in the muddy milk river what rowdy still prone to daydream of matters domestic came back reluctantly to reality and inspected his bait oh come alive i mean the horse round up how we're going to keep that bunch of skeletons under us all summer is a guessing contest for fair wooden shoes has got to give me about forty instead of a dozen if he wants me to hit her up on circle the way i'm used to i bet them backbones will wear clean up through our saddles oh i guess not said rowdy calmly they ain't so thin and they picked up flesh there's some mighty good ones in the bunch too i hope wooden shoes don't forget to give me the first pick there's one i got my eye on that blue roan anyway i guess you can wiggle along with less than forty pink shook his head thoughtfully and sighed pink loved good mounts and the outlook did not please him the roundup had camped for the last time on the river within easy riding distance of camas the next day's drive would bring them to the home ranch where eagle creek was fuming over the lateness of the season the condition of the range and the june rains which had thus far failed even to moisten decently the grass roots let's ride over to camas all the other fellows are gone pink proposed listlessly drawing in his line rowdy as listlessly consented Camus, as a town, was neither interesting nor important. But when one has spent three long weeks communing with nature in her sulkiest and most unamiable mood, even a town without a railroad to its name may serve to relieve the monotony of living. The sun was piling gorgeous masses of purple and crimson clouds high above him, cuddling his fat cheeks against their soft folds till, a Midas, he turned them to gold at the touch those further away gloomed jealously at the favoritism of their lord and huddled closer together the purple for rage perhaps and the crimson for shame pink's face was tinged daintily with the glow and even rowdy's lean brown features were for the moment glorified they rode knee to knee silently thinking each his own thoughts the while they watched the sunset with eyes grown familiar with its barbaric splendor but never indifferent soon the west held none but the deeper tents and the shadows climbed with the stealthy tread of trailing indians from the valley chasing the afterglow to the very hilltops where it stood a moment at bay and then surrendered meekly to the dusk 
a metal lark nearby cut the silence into haunting ripples of melody stopped affrighted at their coming and flew off into the dull glow of the west his little body showed black against a crimson cloud out across the river a lone coyote yapped sharply then trailed off into the weird plaint of his kind brother-in-law's in town to-day bob nevin saw him pink remarked when the coyote ceased wailing and held his peace who rowdy only half heard bob nevin repeated pink naively don't give funny who did bob see brother-in-law yours not mine jesse's tin god if he's there yet i bid for an invite to the swat fest or maybe a horrible possibility forced itself upon pink maybe you'll kill the fattest maverick and fall on his neck the mavericks rowdy's brows were rather pinched together but his tone told nothing nah harry conroy's a fellow's liable to do most any fool thing when he's got school momitis that so pink snorted the possibility had grown to black certainty in his mind he became suddenly furious lord i hope some kind of friend'll lead me out and knock me in the head if ever i get locoed over any darn girl same here agreed rowdy unmoved then your days are sure numbered in words of one syllable old-timer snapped pink rowdy leaned and patted him caressingly upon the shoulder a form of irony which pink detested don't get excited sonny he soothed did you fetch your gun i sure did pink drew a long breath of relief you needn't think i'm going to take chances on being no human colander i've packed a gun for harry conroy ever since that rough riding contest of yarn you mind the way i took him under the ear with a rock he's been making war talk behind my back ever since did i bring my gun well i guess yes he dimpled distractingly all the same it'll suit me not to run up against him said rowdy quite frankly he knew pink would understand then he lifted his coat suggestively to show the weapon concealed beneath and smiled different here you did have sense enough to be ready if you see him and don't forget he's got a sister with a number two foot and if i don't fix you both a plenty he settled his hat more firmly over his curls and eyed rowdy anxiously from under his lashes rowdy caught the action and the look from the tail of his eye and grinned at his horse's ears pink in warlike mood always made him think of a four-year-old child playing pirate with the difference that pink was always in deadly earnest and would fight like a fiend for more reasons than one he hoped they would not meet harry conroy jessie was still in ignorance of his real attitude towards her brother and rowdy wanted nothing more than to keep her so the trouble was he was quite certain to forget everything but his grievances if ever he came face to face with harry also pink would always fight quicker for his friends than for himself and he felt very tender towards pink so he hoped fervently that harry conroy had already ridden back whence he came and there would be no unpleasantness four or five cross l horses stood meekly before the come again saloon so rowdy and pink added theirs to the gathering and went in the silent one looked up from his place at a round table in a far corner and beckoned we need another hand here he said when they went over to him these gentlemen are worried because they might be taken into high society some day and they would be placed in a very embarrassing position through their ignorance of bridge whist i have very magnanimously consented to teach them the rudiments bob nevin looked up and then lowered his eyelid cautiously he's a liar he offered to learn us how to play it we bet him the drinks he didn't savvy the game himself sit down pink and i'll have you for my pretty partner the silent one shuffled the cards thoughtfully to make it seem like bona fide bridge he began we should have everybody playing aw oh, the common ordinary brand is good enough protested bob i ain't in on any trimmings the silent one smiled ever so slightly 
We should have prizes, or favors. Is there a store in town where one could buy something suitable? They got codfish up here. I smell it, suggested Jim Ellis. Him, the silent one, ignored. What do you say, boys, to a real high society whist party? I'll invite the crowd and be the hostess. And I'll serve punch. Come on, fellas, and have one with me, called a strange voice near the door. Meetin's adjourned, cried Jim Ellis, and got up to accept the invitation and range along the bar with the rest. He had not been particularly interested in bridge whist anyway. The others remained seated, and the bartender called across to know what they would have. Pink cut the cards very carefully and did not look up. Rowdy thrust both hands in his pockets and turned his square shoulder to the bar. He did not need to look. He knew that voice with its shoddy hardiness. Men began to observe his attitude and looked at one another. When one is asked to drink with another, he must comply or decline graciously, if he would not give a direct insult. Harry Conroy took three long steps and laid a hand on Rowdy's shoulder, a hand which Rowdy shook off as though it burned. "'Say, stranger, are you too high-toned to drink with a common cow-puncher?' he demanded sharply. Rowdy half turned toward him. "'No, sir, but I'll be mighty thirsty before I drink with you.' His voice was even, but it cut. The room stilled on the instant. It was as if every man of them had turned to clay figures. Harry Conroy had winced at sight of Rowdy's face. Men saw that, and some of them wondered. Pink leaned back in his chair. Every nerve tightened for the next move, and waited. It was Harry, handsome, sneering, a certain swaggering defiance in his pose, who first spoke. Oh, it's you, is it? I haven't saw you for some time. How's Bronco fighting? Gone up against any more contest? He laughed mockingly, with mouth and eyes maddeningly like Jesse's in teasing mood. Rowdy could have killed him for the resemblance alone. His lids drooped sleepily over eyes that glittered. Harry saw the sign, read it for danger, but he laughed again. You should have seen this Bronco Peeler pull leather, boys, he jeered recklessly. I like to die. He got piled up the slickest I ever saw. And there was some feeble-minded Canucks had money up on him, too. He won't drink with me cause I got off with the purse. He's got a grouch, and I don't know as I blame him. He did get let down pretty hard, for a fact. Maybe he did pull leather, but he didn't cut none like you did, you damn skunk. It was pink pink with big, long-lashed eyes, purple with rage, and with a dead-white streak around his mouth and a gun in his hand. Harry wheeled toward him, and if a new light of fear crept into his eyes, his lips belighted in a sneer. Two of a kind, he laughed. So that's the story you brought over here, is it? Hell of a lot of good it'll do you. Something in Pink's face warned Rowdy. Harry's face turned watchfully from one to the other. Evidently, he considered Pink the more uncertain of the two, and he was quite justified in so thinking. Pink was only waiting for a cue before using his gun, and when Pink once began, there was no telling where or when he would leave off. While Harry stood uncertain, Rowdy's fist suddenly spatted against his cheek with considerable force. He tumbled, a cursing heap against the footrail of the bar, scrambled up like a cat, a particularly vicious cat, and came at Rowdy murderously. The come again would shortly have been filled with the pungent haze of burned powder, only that the bartender was a man of action. He hated brawls, and it did not matter to him how just might be the quarrel. He slapped the gaping barrels of a sawed-off shotgun across the bar, and from the look of it, one might imagine many disagreeable things. Drop it. Cut it out, he bellowed. You ain't gonna make no slaughter pen out of this joint, I tell ya. Put up them guns, or else take em outside. If you fellas are hell-bent on smoking each other up, there's all kinds of room outdoors. Get! Vamoose! Hike! Conroy wheeled, 
and walked straight-backed and venomous to the door come on out if you ain't scared he sneered it's two again one and then some by the look of things but i'll take you singly or in bunches i'm ready for a whole damn cross l bunch of coyotes come on you white-livered rowdy rushed for him with pink and the silent one at his heels he had forgotten that harry conroy ever had a sister of any sort whatsoever all he knew was that harry had done him much wrong of the sort which comes near to being unforgivable and that he had sneered insults that no man may overlook all he thought of was to get his hands on him outside the dusky stillness made all sounds seem out of place the faint starlight made all objects black and unfamiliar rowdy stopped just off the threshold blinking at the darkness which held his enemy it was strange that he did not find him at his elbow he thought and a suspicion came to him that harry was lying in wait it would be like him he stepped out of the yellow glare from a window and stood in more friendly shade behind him on the doorstep stood the other two blinking as he had done a form which he did not recognize rushed up out of the darkness and confronted the three belligerently you're a disturbing the peace he yelled we don't stand for nothing like that in camas you're my prisoners all of you the edict seemed to include even the bartender peering over the shoulder of bob nevin who struggled with several others for immediate passage through the doorway i guess not partner retorted pink facing him as defiantly as though the marshal were not twice his size the marshal lunged for him but the silent one reaching a long arm from the doorstep rapped him smartly on the head with his gun the marshal squawked and went down in a formless heap come on boys said the silent one coolly i think we better go your friend seems to have vanished in thin air rowdy grumbling mightily over what looked unpleasantly like retreat was pushed toward his horse and mounted under protest likewise pink who was for staying and cleaning up the whole town but the silent one was firm and there was that in his manner which compelled obedience harry conroy might have been an optical and oral illusion for all the trace there was of him but when the three rode out into the little street a bullet pinned close to rowdy's left ear and the red bark of a revolver spat viciously from a black shadow beside the come again rowdy and the two turned and rode back shooting blindly at the place but the shadow yawned silently before them and gave no sign then the silent one observing that the marshal was getting upon a pair of very unsteady legs again assumed the leadership and fairly forced rowdy and pink into the homeward trail End of chapter 6「seven of Rowdy of the Cross L by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter seven. Rowdy in a tough place. Rowdy, with nice calculation, met Miss Conroy just as she had left the schoolhouse, and noted with much satisfaction that she was riding alone. Miss Conroy, if she had been at all observant, must have seen the light of some fixed purpose shining in his eyes, for Rowdy was resolved to make her a partner in his dreams of matters domestic. And, of a truth, his easy assurance was the thinnest of cloaks to hide his inner agitation. The roundup just got in yesterday afternoon, he told her, as he swung into the trail beside her. We're going to start out again tomorrow, so this is about the only chance I have to see you for a while i knew the round-up must be in said miss conroy calmly i heard that you were in camas a night or two ago inwardly rowdy dodged we camped close to camas he conceded guardedly a lot of us fellows rode into town yes so harry told me she said he came over to see me yesterday he is going to leave has already in fact he has had a fine position offered him by the indian agent at belknap the agent used to be a friend of father's she looked at rowdy sidelong and then went straight at what was in the minds of both 
I'm sorry to hear, Mr. Vaughn, that you were on bad terms with Harry. What was the trouble? She turned her head and smiled at him, but the smile did not bring his lips to answer. It was unpleasantly like the way Harry smiled when he had some deviltry in mind. Rowdy scented trouble and parried. Men can't always get along agreeably together. And you disagree with a man rather emphatically, I should judge. Harry said you knocked him down. Politeness ruled her voice, but cheeks and eyes were aflame. I did. And of course he told you how he took a shot at me from a dark corner outside. Rowdy's eyes, it would seem, had kindled from the fire in hers. No, he didn't. But I... You struck him first. Hitting a man with your fist is one thing, said Rowdy with decision. Shooting at him from ambush is another. Harry shouldn't have done that, she admitted with dignity. But why wouldn't you take a drink with him? Not that I approve of drinking. I wish Harry wouldn't do such things. But he said it was an insult the way you refused. Jesse, Miss Conroy, please. Jesse, he repeated the name stubbornly. I think we'd better drop that subject. You don't understand the case, and anyway, I didn't come here to discuss Harry. Our trouble is long-standing, and if I insulted him, you ought to know I had a reason. I never came whining to you about him. And it don't speak well for him that he hot-footed it over to you with his version. I suppose he'd heard about me, or going to see you, and wanted to queer me. I hope you'll take my word for it, Jesse, that I've never harmed him. All the trouble he's made for himself, one way or another. But what I come over for today concerns just you and me. I wanted to tell you that, to ask you if you'll marry me. I might put it more artistic, Jesse. Well, that's what I mean, and I mean all the things I'd like to say and, and can't. He stopped and smiled at her wistfully, whimsical. I've been three weeks getting my feelings into proper words, little girl, and coming over here I had a speech thought out that sure done justice to my subject. But all I can remember of it is just that, that I want you for always. Miss Conroy looked away from him, but he could see a deeper tint of red in her cheek. It seemed a long time before she said anything. Then, But you've forgotten about Harry. He's my brother, and he'd be, uh, you wouldn't want him related to you. Harry, well, I'll pass him up. I got a pretty long account against him, but I'll cross it off. It won't be hard to do, for you. I thought of all that, and a man can forgive a whole lot in the brother of the woman he loves. He leaned toward her and added honestly, I can't promise you I'll ever get to like him, Jesse, but I'll keep my hands off him, and I'll treat him civil. And when you consider all he's done, that's quite a large-sized contract. Miss Conroy became much interested in the ears of her horse. The only thing to decide is whether you like me enough. If you do, we'll sure be happy. Never mind, Harry. You're very generous, she flared, telling me to never mind Harry. And Harry's my own brother, and the only near relative I've got. I know he's uh, impulsive, and quick-tempered, perhaps, but he needs me all the more. Do you think I'll turn against him, even for you? That even may have been a slip but it heartened Rowdy immensely. I don't ask you to, he told her gently. I only want you to not turn against me. I do wish you two would be sensible and stop quarreling. She glanced at him briefly. I'm willing to cut it out. I told you that. I can't answer for him, though. Rowdy sighed, wishing Harry Conroy in Australia or some place equally remote. Miss Conroy suddenly resolved to be strictly just, and when a young woman sets about being deliberately just, the Lord pity him who she judges. Before I answer you, I must know what this is all about, she said firmly. I want to hear both sides. I'm sure Harry wouldn't do anything mean. Do you think he would? 
Rowdy was dissentingly silent. Do you really, in your heart, believe that Harry would, knowingly, be guilty of anything mean? Her eyes plainly told the answer she wanted to hear. Rowdy looked into them, hesitated, and clung tenaciously to his convictions. Yes, I do. And I know Harry pretty well, Jesse. His face showed how much he hated to say it. I'm afraid you are very prejudiced, she sighed. But go on, tell me just what you have against Harry. I'm sure it can all be explained away, only I must hear what it is. Rowdy regarded her, puzzled. How he was to comply, he did not know. It would be simply brutal to tell her. He would feel like a hangman. And she believed so in Harry, she wouldn't listen. Even if she did, he thought bitterly, she would hate him for destroying her faith. A woman's justice. Oh, me. Don't you see you're putting me in a mighty hard position, girlie? He protested. You're a heap better off not to know. He's your brother. I wish you'd take my word that I'll drop the whole thing right where it is. Harry's had all the best of it so far. Let it stand that way. Her eyes met his coldly. Are you afraid to let me judge between you? What did he do? Daren't you tell? Rowdy's lids drooped ominously. If you call that a dare, he said grimly, I'll tell you fast enough. I was a friend to him when he needed one mighty bad. I helped him when he was dead broke and out of work. I kept him going all winter. And to show his gratitude, he gave me the double cross in more ways than one. I won't go into details. He decided that he simply could not tell her, bluntly, that Harry had worked off stolen horses on him, and worse. Oh, you won't go into details. Scorn filled eyes and voice. Are they so trivial, then? You tell me what you did for Harry, playing Good Samaritan. Harry, let me tell you, has property of his own. I can't see why he should ever be in need of charity. You're like all the rest. You hint things against him, but I believe it's just jealousy. You can't come out honestly and tell me a single instance where he has harmed you or done anything worse than other high-spirited young men. It wouldn't do any good to tell you, he retorted. You think he's just lacking wings to be an angel. I hope to God you'll always be able to think so. I'm sure I don't want to jar your faith. I must say your actions don't bear out your words. You've just been trying to turn me against him. I haven't. I've been trying to convince you that I want you anyway, and Harry needn't come between us. In other words, you're willing to overlook my being Harry's sister. I appreciate your generosity, I'm sure. She did not look, however, as if she meant that. I didn't mean that. Then you won't overlook it? How very unfortunate, because I can't help the relationship. Would you, if you could? He asked rashly. Certainly not. I'm afraid we're getting off the trail, he amended tactfully. I asked you a while back if you'd marry me. And I said I must hear both sides of your trouble with Harry before I could answer. What's the use? You take his part anyway. Not if I found he was guilty of all you insinuate. I should be perfectly just. She really believed that. Can't you tell me yes or no anyway? Don't let him come between us. I can't help it. We'd never agree or be happy. He'd keep on coming between us, whether we meant him to or not, she said dispiritedly. That's a cinch. Rowdy muttered, thinking of Harry's trouble-breeding talents. Then there's no more to be said. Until you and Harry settle your difficulties amicably, or I'm convinced that he's in the wrong, we'll just be friends, Mr. Vaughn. Good afternoon. She rode into the Rodway yard, feeling very just and virtuous, no doubt. But she left Rowdy with some rather unpleasant thoughts, and with a sentiment towards her precious brother, which was not far from manslaughter. End of chapter 7 
Chapter Eight of Rowdy of the Cross L by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Eight. Pink in a threatening mood. Eagle Creek Smith had at last reached the point where he must face new conditions and change established customs. He could no longer ignore the barrenness of the range or close his eyes to the grim fact that his cattle were facing starvation, and that in June when they should be taking on flesh. And when he finally did confess to himself that things couldn't go on like that, others had been before him in leasing and buying land until only the dry benches were left to him and his hungry herds. But Eagle Creek was a man of resource. When the roundup pulled in, and Wooden Shoes reported to him the general state of the cattle, and told of the water holes newly fenced, and of the creek bottoms gobbled by men more far-seeing than he, Eagle Creek took twenty-four hours to adjust himself to the situation, and to meet the crisis before him. His own land, as compared to his twenty thousand cattle, was too pitifully inadequate for a second thought. He must look elsewhere for the correct answer to his problem. When Rowdy rode apathetically up to the stable, Pink came out of the bunkhouse to meet him, big with news. Oh, doctor, we're up against it a plenty now, he greeted with dimples at their deepest. Huh, grunted Rowdy crossly. What's hurting you, Pink? Forecasting the future, Pink retorted. Eagle Creek has come alive and is wised up sudden to the fact that this ain't going to be any Noah's flood brand of summer, and that his cattle look like the tailings of a washboard factory. He's got busy, and we're sure going to. We're due to hit the grit out of here in the first beams of rosy morn, and do a record stunt at gathering cattle. Well, we're going to anyhow, Rowdy cut in. That's only the prelude, old-timer we got to take em across country to the Belknap Reservation. Eagle Creek went to town and telegraphed and, and got the refusal of it for pasturage. He ain't so slow once he gets started, but if you've ever rode over them dried-up benches, you savvy the merry party will be when we get there. I saw jackrabbits packing their lunch along over there. Belknap, Rowdy dropped his saddle spitefully to the ground, is where our friend Conroy has just gone to fill a splendid position. Pink thoughtfully blew the ashes from his cigarette. Harry Conroy would fill one position fine, so one of these days I'll offer it to him. I don't know anybody that'd look nicer in a coffin than that Jasper. And if he's going to Belknap, that's likely the position he'll fill all right. Rowdy said nothing, but his very silence told Pink much. "'How'd you make out with Jesse?' Pink asked frankly, though he was not supposed to know where Rowdy had been. Rowdy knew from experience that it was useless trying to keep anything from Pink that Pink wanted to know. Besides, there was a certain comfort in telling his troubles to so staunch a friend. "'Harry got his work in there, too,' he said bitterly. "'He beat me to her and queered me for good, by the looks.' "'Huh,' said Pink.' I wouldn't waste much time worrying over her if she's that easy turned. She's all right, defended Rowdy quickly. I don't know as I blame her. She takes the stand any sister would take. She wants to know all about the trouble. Hear both sides, she said, so she could judge which was to blame. I guess she's got her heart set on being peacemaker. I know one thing. She likes me all right. I don't see how he queered you any then, puzzled Pink. She sure couldn't take his part after you told her all he'd done. Rowdy turned on him savagely. You little fool. You think I told her? Right there's the trouble. He told his story, and when she asked for mine, I couldn't say anything. She's his sister. You didn't tell? Pink leaned against the stable and stared. Rowdy Vaughn, there's times when even your friend can't disguise the fact that you're plumb batty. You let Harry do you dirt, and any other man to kill him on bare suspicion of doing, and you never told her when she asked you to. How you lend him money and 
and let him steal something right out of your pocket? I couldn't prove that, Rowdy objected. And you never told her about his cutting your latigo? Oh, cut it out. Rowdy glowered down at him. I guess I don't need to be reminded of all those things. But are they the things a man can tell a girl about her brother? Pink, you're about as unfeeling a little devil as I ever run across. Maybe you'd have told her. But I couldn't, so it's all off. He turned away and stared unseeingly at the rim of hills that hid the place where she lived. She seemed very far away from him just then, and very, very desirable. He thought then that he had never before realized just how much he cared. You can just bet I'd have told her, gritted Pink, watching furtively Rowdy's averted face. She ain't gonna be bowed down by no load of ignorance much longer, either. If she don't get Harry Conroy's pedigree straight out without the varnish, it'll be because I ain't next to all his past. But Rowdy, glooming among the debris of certain pet air castles, neither heard nor wanted to hear Pink's wrathful mutterings. As a matter of fact, it was not till Pink clattered out of the yard on mascot that he remembered where he was. Even then, it did not occur to him to wonder where Pink was going. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Rowdy of the Cross L by B. M. Bauer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Tom Penn Chapter 9 Moving the Herd Four thousand weary cattle crawled up the long ridge which divides Chin Coulee from Quitter Creek. Pink, riding point opposite the silent one, twisted round in his saddle and looked back at the slow-moving river of horns and backs veiled in a gray dust cloud. Down the line, at intervals, rode the others, humped listlessly in their saddles. Their hat-brims pulled low over their tired eyes that smarted with dust and wind and burning heat. Pink sighed and wished lonesomely that it was Rowdy riding point with him, instead of the silent one, who grew even more silent as the day dragged leadenly to mid-afternoon. Pink could endure anything better than being left to his thoughts and to the complaining herd for company. He took off his hat, pushed back his curls, dripping wet they were, and flattened unbecomingly in pasty yellow rings on his forehead, and eyed with disfavor a line-backed dry cow with one horn tipped rakishly toward her speckled nose. She blinked silently at wind and heat and forged steadily ahead, uphill and down coolly, always in the lead, always walking, walking like an automaton. Her energy, in the face of all the dry, dreary days, rasped Pink's nerves unbearably. For nearly a week he had ridden left point, and always that line-backed cow with the down-crumpled horn walked and walked and walked, a length ahead of her most intrepid followers. He leaned from his saddle, picked up a rock from the barren yellow hillside, and threw it at the cow spitefully. The rock bounced off her lean rump. She blinked and broke into a shuffling trot, her dragging hoofs kicking up an extra amount of dust, which blew straight into Pink's face. Ah, oh, cut it out, he shouted petulantly. You're sure the limit without doing any stunts at sprittin' uphill. Ain't you got any nerves? You blamed old skate. You act like it was milkin' time and you was headed straight for the bars and a bran mash. Can't you realize the kind of deal you're up against? Here's cattle that's got you skinned for looks, old girl, and they know it's coming blame tough. And you just bat your eyes and peg along like you enjoyed it. Ball or something, can't you? Drop back a foot and act human. The silent one looked across at him with a tired smile. Let her go, Pink, and pray for more like her, he called amusedly. There'll be enough of them dropping back presently. Pink threw one leg over the horn and rode sidewise, made him a cigarette, and tried to forget the cow, or at least to forgive her for not acting as dog-tired as he felt. 
They were on the very peak of the ridge now, and the hill sloped smoothly down before them to the bluff which bounded Quitter Creek. Far down, a tiny black speck in the coulee bottom, they could see wooden shoes riding along the creek bank, scouting for water. From the way he rode, and from the fact that camp was nowhere in sight, Pink guessed shrewdly that his quest was in vain. He shrugged his shoulders at what that meant, and gave his attention to the herd. The marching line split at the brow of the bluff. The line-backed cow lowered her head a bit, and went unfalteringly down the parched, gravel-coated hill, followed by a few hundred of the freshest. Then the stream stopped flowing, and Pink and the Silent One rode back up the bluff to where the bulk of the footsore herd, their senses dulled by hunger and weariness and choking thirst, sniffed at the gravel that promised agony to their bruised feet, and balked at the ordeal. Others straggled up, bunched against the rebels, and stood stolidly where they were. Pink galloped on down the crawling line. Forward, the Standard Oil Brigade! he yelled whimsically as he went. The cowboys heard and understood. They left their places and went forward at a lope, and Pink rode back to the coulee edge, untying his slicker as he went. The silent one was already off his horse, and shouting hoarsely as he whacked with his slicker at the sulky mass. Pink rode in and did the same. It was not the first time this thing had happened, and from a diversion... It was verging closely on the monotonous. Presently, even a rank tenderfoot must have caught the significance of Pink's military expression. The Standard Oil Brigade was at the front in force. Cowboys, swinging five-gallon oil cans, picked up from scattered sheep camps and carried many a weary mile for just such an emergency, were charging the bunch intrepidly. Others made shift with flat syrup cans with pebbles inside. A few, like Pink and the silent one, flapped their slickers till their arms ached. Anything, everything that would make a din and startle the cattle out of their lethargy was pressed into service. But they might have been raised in a barnyard and fed cabbage leaves from back doorsteps for all the excitement they showed. Cattle that three months ago, or a month, would run, head and tail high in the air, at sight of a man on foot, backed away from a rattling, banging cube of gleaming tin, turned and faced the thing dull-eyed and apathetic. In time, however, they gave away doggedly before the onslaught. A few were forced shrinkingly down the hill. Others followed gingerly until the line lengthened and flowed, a sluggish brown-red stream, into the coulee and across to Quitter Creek. Here the headers were browsing greedily upon the banks. They had emptied the few holes that had still held a meager store of brackish water, and so the mutinous bulk of the herd snuffed at the trampled, muddy spots and bellowed their disappointment. Wooden Shoes rode up and surveyed the half-maddened animals gloomily. Push em on, boys, he said. There's nothing for em here. I sent the wagons on to Red Willow. We'll try that next. Push em along all you can. Well, I go on ahead and see. With ten canned slickers and much vituperation, they forced the herd up the coulee side and strung them out again on trail. The line-backed cow walked and walked, in the lead before Pink's querulous gaze, and the others plodded listlessly after. The gray dust cloud formed anew over their slow-moving backs, and the cowboys humped over in their saddles and rode and rode with the hot sun beating a slant in their dirt-grimed faces, and with the wind blowing and blowing. If this had been the first herd to make that dreary trip, things would not have been quite so disheartening. But it was the third. Seven thousand lean kine had passed that way before them, eating the scant grass growth and drinking what water they could find among those barren, sun-baked coolies. The cross L boys, on this third trip, were become a jaded lot of hollow-eyed men, whose nerves were rasped raw with long hours and longer days in the saddle. Pink's cheeks no longer made his name appropriate, and he was not the only one who grew fretful over small things. Rowdy had been heard more than once lately, 
to anathematize viciously the prairie dogs for standing on their tails and chip-chip-chipping at them as they went by. And though the silent one did not swear, he carried rocks in his pockets and threw them with venomous precision at every dog that showed his impertinent nose out of a burrow within range. For Pink, he vented his spleen on the line-backed cow. So they walked and walked and walked. The cattle balked at another hill, and all the tin cans and slickers in the crowd could scarcely move them. The wind dropped with the sun, and the clouds glowed gorgeously above them, getting scant notice, except that they told eloquently of the coming night. And there were yet miles, long, rough, heartbreaking miles, to put behind them before they could hope for the things that tired bodies crave, supper and dreamless sleep. When the last of the herd had sidled, under protest, down the long hill to the flat, dusk was pushing the horizon closer upon them, mile by mile. When they crawled sinuously out upon the welcome level, the hill loomed ghostly and black behind them. A mile out, wooden shoes rode out of the gloom and met the point. He turned and rode beside Pink. "'You'll have to swing em north,' he greeted. "'Redwell is dry as hell, all but the rockin' our field. No use asking old Mullen to let us in there. We'll just go. I'll set the wagons through the fence, and you'll find the camp about a mile up from the mouth of the big coulee. You swing em round the end of the bench and hit that big coulee at the head. When you come to the fence, tear it down.' There's awful good grass in that field. All right, said Pink cheerfully. It was in open defiance of range etiquette, but their need was desperate. The only thing about it Pink did not like was the long detour they must make. He called the news across to the silent one, after wooden shoes had gone on down the line, and they swung the point gradually to the left. Before that drive was over, Pink had vowed many times to leave the range forever and never to turn another cow, besides a good many other foolish things which would be forgotten, once he had a good sleep. And Rowdy, plodding halfway down the herd, had grown exceedingly pessimistic regarding Jessie Conroy, and decided that there was no sense in thinking about her all the time, the way he had been doing. Also, he told himself savagely, that if Harry ever crossed his trail again, there would be something doing. This thing of letting a cur like that run roughshod over a man on account of a girl that didn't care was plumb idiotic. And beside him, the cattle walked and walked and walked, a dim, moving mass in the quiet July night. End of chapter 9